They don't have eyes or ears, but they can find their own food. They lack a brain, but some scientists think they can communicate, cooperate, and even wage war. Perhaps plants lead anything but solitary, sedentary lives. They actively respond to the nutrients and the predators and the herbivores that are around them. But not everyone believes there's a social side to plants. If you talk to a lay person about plant behaviors, you'll just think you're crazy. If you talk to a scientist, they'll think you're crazy and wrong. From nurturing their young to eavesdropping on their neighbors, it seems plants are doing. Whoa. Yeah. And saying quite a bit. It's the plant's way of calling out for help. We just need to listen. Nature holds all truth because in the beginning, nature was created by the truth. And in the beginning, the only word was the truth. The truth is the language of life. It is in everything. It is encoded into everything. It is our DNA. Why have we failed to listen to the truth? It is because we've allowed the ones who allege to protect us, the scientists, to defile the DNA of all life. Following the Darwinian theory makes people believe that the predatory lifestyle is acceptable. That is in the plant world, in the animal world, and in our world. This includes your religious leaders, your scientific leaders, and now world leaders. The question is, how do they do it? How do plants find the food they're looking for, both above the ground and below it, when they have no eyes, no ears, let alone no brain? Well, the feeding habits of this strange snake-like vine may hold the answer. It's called the daughter vine, the Count Dracula of the plant world. The vine has no roots and can't produce its own food, so it lives entirely off a host plant. And it has just 72 hours to find that host or it dies. Its tiny teeth-like probes pierce the stem and grow into its victim, draining it of its life-giving sap. And this botanical vampire seems to prefer some plants over others. Tomatoes are among its favorite victims. So how does it find its host? And how does it choose between one plant or another? J.C. Cahill has come to Pennsylvania to meet Consuelo de Mores and Mark Mesher, the scientists who solved that mystery. So there's a patch here of uh, our species that grows locally. We brought this plant to the lab, this parasitic plant, Cascuta daughter. We're looking at how these plants interact, but how do they find the host? And we thought for sure somebody had already done that. And then we went back to the literature and there was nothing on that. So what would happen to daughter if it just was really poor in its ability to detect its host. Well, these guys are, are, are obligate parasites, really, so they're completely dependent on the host plant. So a seedling of daughter has to find a host plant within uh, you know, a few days, or they'll exhaust their energy resources and die. So really, we expect really uh, intense pressure on these guys to be good at, uh, at, at foraging and identifying their host. But while the daughter vine may be good at finding a victim, could it actually choose between two different host plants? Demoraz and Mesher made it their mission to find out. In a series of experiments, they placed wheat and tomato seedlings in the same pot and planted a newly sprouted daughter vine between them. Then they set up a time-lapse camera to see if the seedling was actually making a choice. For hours, it circles the air like a snake, as if sniffing out its victims. 
and nine times out of 10, its preferred victim is the juicy tomato, a tender plant that's easier to attach to. You really get the sense of a behavior response. So really, there is some fairly strong selection here for this plant to make the right decision, otherwise it will die. But how was the little stem making its choice? The team decided to play a hunch. They knew that all plants produce green leaf volatiles, chemical scents released by their leaves as they breathe. So maybe this predatory plant actually was sniffing out its victim. To test that theory, the team devised another experiment. First, they captured the scent of a tomato, essentially condensing the chemical odor released by the plant. Once it's distilled, they present the tomato perfume to the vine. Along with a real tomato, it can't possibly smell. Time after time, the daughter hones in on the chemical language that says, yes, I'm a tomato. There's no doubt with the daughter, there's choice. There's choice involving the, uh, a suitable host or non-suitable host. This is a very familiar thing in animal foraging behavior that we're seeing in this plant foraging behavior. It is also the behavior of blood sucking parasites in the environment around you, the air around you, that feed off you. And like the data plant, they are attracted by chemicals that you release. Mosquito are attracted by the carbon dioxide gas you release when you get hot, when you sweat. The elements of the apple Water, sugar and yeast create this gas and the apple is a solid version of liquid, alcohol. Alcohol is made from the apple, cider, and all fruits create alcohol, the grapes, wine, etc. This gas alerts the microbes, the bugs, the parasites and the mosquitoes in the atmosphere around you that you are a good source of food or a good host for its eggs. Scientists have discovered that everyone walks around in a cloud of bacteria. They have penetrated the force field around you, which gets weakened by chemicals like alcohol, hallucinogens and smoke. The oldest chemical was sugar from the apple. And yeast is the oldest organism. It feeds and thrives off of sugar. It was first discovered on the apple and then the bread. And Baldwin has discovered that this plant has another secret weapon, specifically designed to rid itself of caterpillars. This is a trichome, a sweet little treat deposited by the plant and irresistible to caterpillars. Beautiful, yes, but it's as lethal as a landmine. When this little guy chows down on a trichome, it gets a very bad case of body odor. 20 minutes after eating the trichome, they're smelling. So what we've learned from these particular smells is that they inform predators, particularly ground foraging predators. The plant is offering this nice little sugary first meal for the caterpillars, but it's an evil lollipop because the caterpillar gets tagged for predation. It's the razor blade in the apple yeah, at Halloween time. When you understand the story of how the tobacco plant was created by the Peruvian Indians after drinking a highly hallucinogenic substance, ayahuasca, they said that they received knowledge of how to grow tobacco from the cosmic serpent. And then you understand the story of how the apple tree got into our world from the knowledge of the cosmic serpent, one of many forms of the spirit of evil, then you see that the tobacco 
attracts creatures to be tagged by predators. The same is for you when you bite into the apple because you get tagged by all the bugs, the parasites and the deadly Zika carrying mosquito. Not everything in nature comes from the creator of all the truth in nature. Their most famous scientist Einstein once said, anyone that becomes seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced a spirit, not a force, a spirit was manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man. And when you understand the origins of everything, you begin to see that the story of the apple tree, the so-called tree of knowledge, didn't come from the mind of the creator of all truth. It come from the mind of the deceitful one, the liar. So therefore, anything he creates is impregnated with his DNA. And your DNA holds memories. So anything this entity or spirit creates is full of lies. That is why the tobacco plant kills and the apple full of sugar also destroys you. It rots teeth, therefore it rots bones and lets cancer into your bones. And all fruit make alcohol and that destroys you physically and mentally. For herd animals like these elephants, recognizing family members is an important part of social life. In fact, for many animals, kin recognition is an essential skill. Animals use kin recognition for two things, to recognize their relatives and avoid mating with them, and to benefit their relatives in social interaction. So animals may give off warning calls if there's a predator near, only if their relatives are near, but not if strangers are around. And animals will generally avoid mating with relatives. It's well known that plants have a mechanism to at least avoid mating with themselves, so it's a kind of kin recognition. But people hadn't known if plants could benefit their relatives in social interactions, so and that's what we've been working on. When she began her research, Dudley knew that plants could sense the presence of other plants above the ground. Using photo or light receptors in their leaves, they can sense when they're being shaded by a neighbor and respond by growing taller or in a different direction to compete for light. And plant roots have a similar ability. People have shown that plant roots would respond differently to their own roots than to a neighbor's root. So the question is, can they do anything? Do they know who they're interacting with? So I said, well, this is a good place to look for kin recognition, because wouldn't it be cool? So this is the right habitat. So Dudley and student Amanda File headed for the shores of Lake Ontario on a hunt for a very special kind of plant to see if its roots behave differently when growing next to its kin. It's called sea rocket and its reproductive behavior made it ideal for a kinship study. Ah, oh, here's a good sized plant. Sea rocket produces two different kinds of seed pods, one of which clings to its mother, resulting in seedlings that often grow up side by side in a family group. It's in flower and it's got a few big fruits. This is probably the biggest one. And because they're annual plants, the mother plant dies, you can get buried by, you know, by the wind and the waves. And so you have a whole bunch of seedlings potentially coming up from that buried dead mother plant. So they would all be siblings sharing the same mother. And family members were exactly what Dudley was after. In a series of experiments, she and File planted some sea rocket siblings together and others with unrelated plants. After a few weeks, they cleaned the roots, weighed them, then checked to see if there was a difference between those growing with siblings versus strangers. I was extremely shocked because we got exactly what we predicted. And this doesn't happen often in science. We're predicting 
uh, response, we found exactly that, that. With siblings, there was lower root allocation than with strangers. In other words, strangers grew more roots to compete for food, while siblings politely restrained their root growth. So was that evidence of a family sharing resources? Was it proof of altruistic behavior? Altruism is defined as doing a benefit to others at some cost to yourselves. And it's one of the things that get involved by kin selection, but it's not the only one. I discovered that their most famous scientist talked of a spirit within. And you also know this was what Jesus came to teach of, the spirit within. And before him, two and a half thousand years ago, Hippocrates teaches that everything has a soul. And many people speak of a life force. Altruism was the trait of Jesus. He knew that he had to teach you to save your life. No matter what they would do to him, that was his object in life, to save you by teaching you the truth. Two plants that do not compete avoid paying that cost of competition, and because they're benefiting a relative, their genes are passed on to a greater extent. But whether it's a case of enlightened self-interest or a selfless sharing of resources, no one knew how these plants were identifying their kin. Dudley knew that all plants exude chemicals from their roots, so maybe sea rocket roots were identifying one another via chemical signals. To test that theory, Dudley and her collaborators turned to Arabidopsis, a fast-growing plant that exhibited the same kin response as sea rocket. When they placed two siblings in water and blocked all chemical signals, the seedlings suddenly started ramping up their root growth. Without the ability to chemically communicate, siblings had become strangers. Is it communication? Are they deliberately sending a signal? That we don't know. That's something that we can't answer yet. It's also something that science doesn't want to answer. As that gentleman in the beginning said, they will call you mad and say you are wrong. You see, the protocol of science is to keep the secret from you. Mine is different. My path is the path to truth. And as this documentary is proving that animals use kin recognition, plants use kin recognition. It's so that they don't mate with their family. So why does the story teach of Adam and Eve in the Bible that had an incestuous relationship? What caused this incestuous relationship? It was the fruits from the so-called tree of knowledge. And that fruit was originally the apple. And as that experiment proves, it was a chemical that blocked the signals from plant to plant. It's a chemical that blocks the signals from cell to cell in your body. And the oldest one is sugar. And especially in liquid form, it causes destruction within, chaos in your body and in your mind, leading to chaos in the world around you. Brother to attack brother. And internally, this is called autoimmune disease. Science does know what is killing you because they are the cause. And they do know what cures you. The answer is in nature. And that is what they deny you. Since then, Dudley's lab has gone on to document sibling responses in at least three other species of plants. Now, she and File are moving on to study some of the longest lived plants on Earth. To answer an even more surprising question, do mother trees nurture their young? It's a question that's been asked before. On the other side of the continent, 
There's a species of tree that's defying all of our expectations about the social lives of plants. In the feature film Avatar, an ancient mother tree creates a magical network that sustains every living organism in the forest. Here, in the rainforests of British Columbia, scientist Suzanne Simard has been studying the real mother trees and the vast underground networks they create to nurture their own kind. When I saw the movie Avatar, I was sitting in the audience with my 3D glasses on and there is the, the mother tree and the network growing out of the mother tree and I just went, oh, they read my papers. Those papers focused on the magnificent Douglas fir, a tree that can live up to a thousand years and grow to a staggering height of more than 300 feet. But like all trees, only part of its total mass can be seen above the ground. I feel when I'm walking through the forest that I'm gliding past an iceberg, because what I am seeing is just the tip of what's going on. What we see above ground is just such a small fraction of the body of the ecosystem. In a lot of ecosystems, over two-thirds of what you see is actually below ground. We're seeing one-third of the body of the forest. That mysterious underground world has preoccupied Samard for more than a decade. But while evolutionary theory told a story about competition, the trees themselves were telling her a different story. We think of them as these individuals that are just competing against each other. You know, I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get it, and, and you're not going to get it. And that's really led a lot of the thinking, and we've long ignored you know, a lot of the other interactions other than competition. But at the same time, there's a community effect that we haven't understood, and we're just starting to really look at this and understand that, that this is a system. It's not just a bunch of individuals competing against each other. They're working together to make this system work. So what does that community look like? And how do trees work together? To answer these questions, Samard focused not only on the below ground world of the Douglas fir, but on their relationship with some of the strangest looking organisms in the forest. And these trees are all connected below ground by their roots and, and also by fungi. And you can often see the fruiting bodies of the fungi right next to old trees like this. Neither plant nor animal, the fruiting bodies of fungi like this bloom in the spring and fall. Each of their gills is filled with tiny spores, the source of the next generation. And just like the fruiting bodies of trees, Mushrooms represent only a tiny fraction of a vast organism that lives below the ground in networks made up of roots and organic material, like this bright yellow fungal tissue. If we could see in that soil, we'd realize there's layer after layer of just networks. That, and these are big organisms, just like these trees are really, really big. So too are the mushrooms. They're just flat and they happen to be predominantly in the soil. When you're walking on the forest floor, you're walking on this massive amount of fungus material. And the, so anything that grows or germinates in the forest floor can't help but be colonized. In fact, the massive underground roots of fir trees are colonized by below ground fungi because the fungi can't produce their own food. Instead, their vast underground networks tap into the roots of trees and other plants. The plants provide the fungi with carbon-based sugar, and the fungal network returns the favor, providing the trees with nutrients. 
Many plant species are dependent on fungi for their survival, and the Douglas fir is no exception. In turn, the underground fungi are equally dependent on the tree's carbon. It absolutely needs that carbon. It cannot live without the carbon from the tree. There's a signaling that goes on between the root and the fungus, and they say, hey, we can help each other out. And the reason the trees associate and do this for the fungi is that the fungi are so small, right? They can crawl into little soil spaces that roots can't grow. It costs a lot less in carbon to support the fungi than to build its own root system. And so it's a great trading system, but it shuttles a lot of carbon to the fungi. The fungi then shuttle it between themselves from fungus to fungus, but also fungi can also connect the trees together. Samard has demonstrated that vast underground fungal networks link the Douglas firs together into a kind of resource sharing community. We found that the big old Douglas fir are hubs for this massive network that is connecting pretty much all the trees in the forest. And the bigger the tree and the older the tree, the more roots that are it's growing and the more mycorrhizal connections that it has. And what we found is that those connections are providing really a rearing ground for the new trees that are coming up. And experiments like this one demonstrate how that network operates. First, Samard and graduate student Marcus Bingham bag the branches of an older mother tree then expose it to radioactive carbon-14, a gas the tree naturally absorbs to produce its food. Okay, so let's just inject this uh, C14 or radioactive gas, CO2 gas, and within a few hours it's going to be coming down the trunk in its sugars and into the root system, and then in a day or two we should see the radioactivity. Days later, the team returns to track where the radioactive carbon has gone using a Geiger counter. The results are nothing short of amazing. Yeah, let's pull out the Geiger counter, see what we've got. Oh, yeah. Not only has the underground network shuttled the mother tree's carbon-based food to surrounding trees, experiments like this one reveal that the biggest beneficiaries are the youngest, most vulnerable trees. It's right in the foliage. Mm -hmm. So that parent tree is really giving lots of carbon to its offspring here. The seedling over here and see if that's picked up. Sure. Okay. Oh yeah, this is this is all hot down here. It's great, the whole network's lit up. Yeah. Yeah. That provides this great source of nourishment for those little seedlings. In an old forest, you can imagine that there's, there's not a lot of light. It's quite shaded. They don't have the ability to fix their own carbon very well. They're really being nurtured and grown up as a, as a community, as a family almost. And it's those relationships that really build the forest. It's really a, a beautiful, self-organizing, complex system. What we're finding is amazing, and I know that there are naysayers out there, but those of us who are seeing this are just going, wow, it's awesome. So if mother trees can nurture their own kind, if plants can recognize family members and communicate with their friends and foes, how are they doing it if they have no brain? no way to organize or integrate the information they receive. It's an interesting question, both philosophically, but also biologically. How do you integrate information if you don't have a nervous system? Plants may have a parallel system. There, may be, there has to be something that's doing this integration. We just don't know what to look for. Maybe we're not quite as smart as we thought we were, and perhaps plants are a lot more intelligent than we ever imagined. Where did the plants get their intelligence from? Where did you originally get your intelligence from? Nowadays you only have the knowledge 
of your religious leaders and your scientific leaders. But long before religion and science, there was just intelligence. There was none of these educational systems because we just knew we were impregnated with the wisdom of truth. Now, evidence has got more interesting. If life came together after a big bang, as science would have you believe, where did motherly instinct come from then? It is in the plant world, as you just now discovered, the animal world, and our world. It's deep within you all, that intelligence is still there. You just got to know how to unlock it. And this piece of the documentary is going to teach you how. Water circulating the earth and nurturing the soil is the source of all life forms on this planet. But there is a side of water that has gone unexplored until now. Dr. Masaru Emoto of IHM General Institute has studied water for many years. Through his research, he has come up with an innovative new way to capture the essence of water. Based on his work, he has published a collection of photographs entitled Messages from Water. <laughs> え、その私がなぜ、え、このような、あ、技法を編み出したこと、編み出したのか。ま、なかなか自分でも不思議なんですが、いわゆる従来科学の掘り方全く考え方ではこの見えない世界、水とか波動だとかそういう世界には入れな
which means to gain the healing and transforming powers of the life force energy. It is the power to dip inside the spiritual realm without the aid of hallucinogens like ayahuasca that connects to the wrong realm. Hado is the force, it is an energy, a vibrational force, and using a vibration machine called an MRA, he said he transferred vibrational information onto micro clustered water, small drops of water. This, he said, created a special kind of water and created Hado water. Many symptoms caused by illness were cured with this water. Over 10,000 people were treated. This concept that water alone could cure was hard to accept for many people, especially medical doctors. What people fail to see is there are two sides to this force, light and dark. They see the dark side create alcohol that kills using water, but fail to accept that water can be used to heal. Dr. Emoto says water's ability to retain information had already been discussed. Water will retain information it picks up. You are the same, but you fail to see that your information comes from the side that uses religion to cause holy wars and science to create cigarettes, alcohol and atom bombs that uses water to fight their holy wars. This is the side that tricks you there are no cures. That is why they ridicule people like Dr. Emoto or suppress his information and you follow their religions and science like lambs to the slaughter because the only information you retain is what they teach you and sadly many of you think you know what you need to know. This train of thought is dangerous. You must always think you know nothing, but you want to know. This keeps the hunger and the search for knowledge and the truth alive inside you. But when you think you know, you become arrogant. And arrogance is your downfall. Many of you fail to see that the scientists that they trick you to follow talk of a spirit which manifests itself in everything. This is what Einstein said. He said that he received his knowledge from outer space. He grew up around mystics, which uses the spiritual realms. Ayahuasca enters the spirit realms. That's why people have visions of snakes. The snake made the apple tree. You also fail to see that their religions follow a spirit and it now must be obvious which spirit their religion and science follows. But when someone from the good side, people like Emoto and soon you will discover Johan Granda and including myself and others, teach you that we have healed certain diseases you ridicule us because you believe there are no cures. You see, this is the information that you retain. It's all that you recall. So when every time someone mentions the cure or a cure, you can't comprehend it. So you ridicule it. And that is the first instinct that they taught you to ridicule what you don't understand. Only a fool does this. You should now listen and you will understand how life works and how one group of people have always wanted it to work for them. Life is truly amazing. You are truly amazing. And like the animals, the plants and the water, you can retain all information you pick up when you know how to access your memory bank. It was a book that triggered Dr. Emoto's interest in the study of frozen water crystals. 
価値として同じものはないと、まあ、いう情報があったんですあそうか雪の結晶うん雪も水だだから雪に結晶があるんなら水にもそれを凍らせたならばね、えー、結晶があるんではないかとまあ思ったんですね This is how our study of frozen water crystals began. We did not, however, achieve instant success. まあ、石橋君というんですが、えー、その人と僕とのコンビネーションも良かったんでしょうね、えー、最終的に、まあ、60日後ぐらいに初めて取れたわけですその時はもう本当に感動いたしましたもう涙がもう出るぐらいに嬉しかったですねですから、えー、写真集の最初の方にその初めて取れた結晶を紹介しておりますけれどももう一生涯忘れられない結晶です。Since then, we have gradually expanded our photographic collection while accumulating data. Some of the water we examined showed no crystal formation whatsoever. One such example was tap water. From what we could observe, beautiful crystals were a rarity when it came to tap waters of Japan. This was also the case in certain cities outside of Japan. As we continued our research, we began to discover that certain types of water produced beautiful crystals, while others did not. Dr. Emoto cured many people with his water, but some live far away, and many are sick children in hospital. So he asked these patients to send him pictures, and using these pictures, he made water for each patient. And this also cured many people. Sometimes, in most urgent cases, photos could not be found, so Dr. Emoto used their name, and he discovered that words retain vibrational information. Dr. Emoto then exposed the water to words. He thought that water might have the ability to sense vibration and give us some answers. The first word we exposed water to was arigato. This is a Japanese word for thank you. The result was a formation of a beautiful crystal structure. Conversely, this is what happened when we exposed the water to negative words, such as you fool. What many people fail to understand, and most of my other documentaries prove, is I have unearthed the fact that this knowledge has been with us for thousands of years and used against us by one group of people. This book tells of the hold that the words of power and magical names have over millions of people to this day. Also, that arising in the world today are new political groupings which are emerging upon the world stage. These political groupings are creating such words and names which will, in years to come, be charged with the magical power over the minds and hearts of men. Well, it is obvious now which words these people retain. Their religion included words of war, hatred, racialism, revenge, sickness, and disease, and rancid lies.
As a result, we observed major differences in crystal formation. crystals. Gentle words manifest as gentle crystals. By appearing before us in its crystal form, water is letting us see the hidden power behind words. When words can have effect on water so much, what do they do to man? They can make man take his own life in the form of ridicule and take the life of others in the form of laws that allow them to go to war against innocent victims like we recently witnessed in Iraq. Religion, science and the rule of law was brought to the Western world by one group of people after being kicked out of every Middle Eastern country. Wake up America! These are the people that control your country. Mr. Amoto's work provides factual evidence that human vibrational energy, thoughts, words, ideas, and music affect the molecular structure of water. Please remember that water comprises over 70% of a mature human body and covers the same amount on our planet. Water is the very source of all life. This photo shows the beautifully formed geometric design of the Yushi Spring water. This next photo is from the Shimanto River, the last clean spring in Japan. Notice the extraordinary geometric forms. The fact that the molecular structure of water can be affected by our consciousness, our intent, and our sounds is extremely important. This photo is from the Mount Cook Glacier in New Zealand. Mr. Moto has been visually documenting these molecular changes in water by means of his photographic techniques. He freezes droplets of water, then examines them under a dark field microscope that has photographic capabilities. His work clearly demonstrates the diversity of the molecular structure of water and the effects of the environment upon the structure of the water. This photo is from the fountain in Lourdes, France. This photo is from contaminated water from the Yodo River in Japan. In this photo we can compare the contaminated water with clean stream water. Look at the difference. Mr. Omoda decided to see what effects music would have upon the structure of water. He placed distilled water between two speakers for several hours while playing different music and then photographing the crystals that formed after the water was frozen. This photo is of water being exposed to Beethoven's Pastorale. This photo is the effect of box air for the G-string on the water. This photo is water exposed to Chopin's farewell song. This next photo is water being exposed and affected to music that was designed for healing. This photo is of water being exposed to the Kawachi folk dance. This photo shows the effect of heavy metal music upon the water. Here now we can compare the effects of healing versus heavy metal music and what happens to the water molecules.
The group of people that control all science have known that vibration, energy and frequency can affect water. Therefore, it can affect us. Vibration and frequency and energy are ways that our body signals from cell to cell, from organ to organ. It's how we push waste out of our body via vibration. When you're low in energy or lacking in water, this process fails. And this is what they call constipation. It is actually quite serious to not be able to remove your waste from your body. It's highly toxic to all the other cells and organs around it. You see, you must now begin to see that they use this science to destroy you. They use the destructive side of this science because it's the only signal that they pick up. My other documentaries have taught sugar and salt are quartz crystals. They are both receivers of tones, of frequency. They are liquid crystals and in its liquid crystal form sugar creates alcohol salt creates saline solution alcohol destroys you and then the hypocrites give you a saline solution after the destruction of the alcohol and the operations that you've had to undergo because of the alcohol that is because the sugar picks up the destructive vibrations around you this is what Emoto was teaching, that he was picking up the healing tone. Salt picks up the healing tone. Salt also heals you in many ways. It neutralizes the chemical effects of the acid, that is sugar. Sugar also stops light from getting into the cell. It shrouds it in darkness. This leads to depression and deep thoughts of suicide. It also leads to all sickness. That's why sickness shows up as a dark cloud on x-rays that flash a beam of light through your body. The salt allows the light into you. It allows your cells to grow, to nurture. It allows your body to heal itself. They have known this always that is why their science controlled you chemically with your foods and your water and now your atmosphere which they control vibrationally which is their words sounds and slogans which is their education religion science and they also control history and they use sound waves and radio waves that's why the atmosphere around you is flooded with sound waves and radio waves and they also use lights, images, pictures, posters, and now they use the TV and internet. Even more sinister, they now have a machine, HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, that can send vibrations, frequencies, into your subconscious mind, bypassing your conscious mind, just straight into your subconscious mind. And this is the information that you will retain and you won't even know it's there, but you'll act upon it when they want you to. Just like what they did to the British. They created racism in their society by completely flooding the papers for 20 years. I witnessed it growing up there about the black people and the Irish people. The British never thought kindly of these two people. You see, because they knew words can destroy us, but they always used dark words, destructive words. And now they are using destructive vibration. I witnessed this machine, Harp, being tested out on the British youth. And when questioned, the government, the Labour government, the one that caused the Iraq war, that used the lies and the laws to cause it, and then used that same law to flood their foods with chemicals, 
said that they were sending high audio frequency that only the teenagers could hear. Well, this is also the machine that they are now using to program your music. Here is a clip of what this machine can do to you. I'm going to put. I'm going to put. Up, so this. This is. This is voices that are in 440 frequency. Now, right. it was Rothschild that painted this. It keeps everybody on edge. Now, what this is a gongly meter, and what it is, this is what your voices will sound like. So this is African. You see? Yeah. So that middle, that middle part well, that's fuzzing this, up. This is what sounds are doing to your body. This is what it's doing to the water and the minerals and the salt and everything in your body. Right? It's keeping you on edge. Now, when you did your call to the prayer, it didn't move. Oh, hang on, hang on. Sorry, I'm on. I'm a... It's hardly moving. Look. Oh, Nothing's no, playing no, in the background, that's why. It's playing in the background. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now watch. It's not even moving. It's not even moving. That's <laughs> It's called... Now that, that is in 432. That's the earth tone. And that's a healing tone. Wow. So there's proof. That is proof there. Wow. That you're hitting the right notes. What you're essentially doing... This, this for me... It stops when I stop it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. The mouse. Because yeah. I'm stopping exactly, and it, you know, your voice. You, you know, I don't know how much more proof people want. Look at this. Like, so you've got African. And even the music you played as well. Do you remember even you played the music? music? Yeah, yeah. Let's put the music. On. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. Show you what music does. This is proof that they they're messing around with us. So, all right. That's what 440 frequency is doing to your bodies. No. That's what it's doing inside their bodies when we hear it. So it keeps you on edge. This is why people dance. This is why babies, when they're yeah, first born, yeah. can't not move to drums. Because drums have an effect on your body. That's nuts. Right? It's proof. It's proof. Many scientists are now discovering that certain physical disease and psychological disorders in certain people is emotional trauma. You have just discovered that words can affect water. And we are 78% water. And the reason why this trauma affects certain people is because they blame themselves. Because of the word blame. They believe that they are to blame for whatever went on in their young life when they were young. Maybe their parents split up. Or one of their siblings was run over. They blame themselves until they release it and this is where some forms of psychology can help the individual because they help the person release this trauma you see words can affect water we are 78 percent water chemicals can also affect water water is also amazing as you are soon to discover but the fact that water can retain information and has a memory is proof that something is erasing our memory or affecting our memory. And you just discovered from the clip about the plants, chemicals affected their behavior or chemicals affect ours. We know that alcohol affects our behavior. Hallucinogenic drugs affect our behavior and even their pharmaceutical drugs also the chemicals they put in our foods that they trick us with words like additives preservatives and taste enhancers these must have a detrimental effect on our behavior also because sickness comes from somewhere and if water holds memories then it will hold the memories of how to cure a disease so how is it the water is forgetting how to remove the disease from our body? They have denied the special properties of water. They have known. They've experimented on it. They created alcohol with it. They created atom bombs with it. So they have put water under very high stress. 
The truth will always out. And many scientists are discovering what Masuru Emoto was teaching that water holds memories.